Explosions are cool. This is something most people agree on. Fireworks are used worldwide for a variety of celebrations. But the explosions that set off this massive spectacles are small change compared to the explosions of the cosmos. In the previous video in this series on stellar evolution, we talked about how the sun will meet its end. But the sun is very different from many other stars that end their lives in a far more violent way. Welcome to the final video in this series on stellar evolution. My name's Thomas, you're watching Inversion Science, and this is how massive stars die. Now, more so than in previous videos, I will highly recommend that if you haven't watched the previous video on how the sun will die, I would really recommend you watch it, because a lot of this content I'm talking about in this video heavily builds on the previous one. So it's in the top right hand corner. In the last video, we talked about stars like the sun running out of hydrogen in their core and starting to burn in a shell around a helium core as it builds up to the point where it can start fusing helium with a helium flash. Now massive stars also run out of hydrogen in their cores, but their helium cores are already exceeding the schoenberg chandrasekhar limit, which is the limit on how much mass can be in the core and not fusing before it collapses. Since the core is already greater than this limit, it starts to contract on the dynamical timescale, or freefall. This is extremely quick, only lasting around 1% of the main sequence lifetime. Now massive stars don't have the same extreme helium flash that smaller stars do. They reach their temperature for helium ignition much more easily and just start fusing, becoming red giants. Like with the sun, the helium in the core will eventually run out, leaving a carbon and oxygen core in the centre. The sun will never fuse carbon, it's just not big enough, but massive stars like Betelgeuse can. When they contract down, they get to temperatures in the region of 600 to 800 million Kelvin, which is enough to fuse carbon. Now this core that's left is mostly carbon and oxygen, and since carbon has the lower potential barrier, it fuses first into magnesium. This magnesium can decay into a variety of different elements. The decays are on the screen now because there are too many to go into in detail. Now this sort of process with the running out of elements in the core to cause it to contract and cause the star to expand happens many times with fusing shells appearing around ever heavier and heavier cores. This continues all the way up to iron, specifically iron 56. Iron is an extremely stable atom. Some would claim that iron 56 is the most stable isotope of any element. Although there are some studies that show that iron 58 and nickel 62 could be more stable with a higher binding energy per nucleon, which is protons and neutrons. Once we reach this iron core, no more fusion can happen. No star will get hot enough to fuse beyond that through these sorts of methods. So this core contracts, but the gravitational pressure on this is extreme, enough to overcome electron degeneracy pressure. When this happens, the protons and electrons combine to become neutrons, and it compresses further until we get neutron degeneracy pressure, another consequence of the Pauli exclusion principle. Now this neutron degeneracy pressure leaves us with a sphere of neutrons that's not fusing anything. But what about all these outer layers? This core has collapsed away from under them, meaning there is nothing to support them anymore. So gravity takes hold, accelerating the outer layers in at extreme speeds until they hit this neutron degenerate object. When these outer cores collapse onto the neutron core, two effects take hold. One is that there is an extreme shock wave that propagates throughout the outer layers, causing explosive nucleosynthesis, causing fusion in these outer layers. This, combined with neutrino flux, neutrinos being expelled from the core, causes these outer layers to explode into space violently, in an explosion we call a supernova. These explosions last for months and are bright enough to outshine entire galaxies. I did tell you fireworks were kind of puny. After a supernova, we are left with one of two things, which depends on the mass of the star at the point the iron core collapsed. If the star at this point had a mass between about 8 and 25 solar masses, then what we are left with we call a neutron star. When the core collapsed, we ended up with this core of neutrons, and when the supernova happens, it leaves behind this core. 
This core is very hot and very dense, consisting almost entirely of neutrons, and it is extremely dense, with 10 to the 44 grams per cubic centimetre. This is a density beyond real comprehension. At least with the electron degenerate helium cores, we could relate it to aircraft. But this is so dense that you're talking about trillions of planets compressed into something the size of a teaspoon. But these aren't the densest objects. If the star exceeded 25 solar masses at the point where the iron core collapsed, we get something even more cool, a black hole. The gravity on this mass is so strong that it can overcome neutron degeneracy pressure, compressing all of the mass down to a singularity, a single point. There is so much mass here that there is a point outside of a black hole that light can't even escape from, called the event horizon. But that is a topic I covered more extensively in my video on how we can see behind black holes, which if you want to watch, it'll be in the top right hand corner. Anyway, that's how large stars die. I really hope you've enjoyed this series on stellar evolution. If you'd like to read more about the topics I covered in this video, then there's a blog post in the description below with all the sources I used for this video. Down there you will also find a link to a blog post with the sources for the entire series if you want to explore this in a bit more detail. Although the series is over, I will have more videos coming out soon on a variety of topics including why fusion is actually better than nuclear fission. So make sure you subscribe and hit the bell icon for that. If you have any comments, criticisms, questions or suggestions for future videos then please leave them in the comment section below. And in the meantime, I've been Thomas, you've been watching Inversion Science, and I'll see you in the next video.